Welcome to Homeland, 10 Stories, 1 Israel. Israel has brought together millions of Jews from across the diaspora in the world's most chaotic family reunion. This podcast is about what that really looks like. Though this series is fictional, each person is based on real stories shared with us by real people. This week, we'll meet a Jewish community who lived in Israel before it was called Israel, who came not to cities, but to deserts, swamps, wastelands, and built the country we know today. Amalia bar Oz is the daughter of two history teachers, which means that she's heard her family's history recited so many times that it's been worn smooth, like a stone whose features have been rubbed away by the sea. She can answer the Americans' questions broadly. Why did your great-grandmother Hesia come here? Pogroms. How did she get here? A boat. Where did she come from? Somewhere Slavic, cold, and anti-Semitic. You know, it's interesting. My mother is the real memory keeper. She used to tell so many stories. She saw it all living on a kibbutz. The founding of the state, all of the wars. It must have been amazing to hear about all of that firsthand. She made it come alive. Even things that happened before she was born, like her grandmother's life. How her grandmother came here, uh, what she had to survive. Another sad story, huh? Mm, they're all a little bit sad, no? God, I hope not. I should say it differently. They all have sadness. This is just a part of being a human being. I think my great-grandmother, Hesia, she had a story with a lot of sadness but also a lot of strength. In the end, she got what she wanted, a home where she could be free, even though she had to sacrifice a lot for it. That seems to be a theme today. It's a theme in this country, like Roe said. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> I'd love to hear about your great-grandmother, if you want to share. I'll do the best I can. Ah, okay. So, my great-grandmother, Hesia, was born on a cold day in March in a corner of an empire that no longer exists. Hesia was a year old when the mob ripped her life apart. She had no memory of this, of course. Not like her older brother Laib, who had been six years old when the horde descended on their house with axes and clubs. He had seen what the mob did to their parents, had attended their father's funeral, holding Hesia in his arms because Mama's arm was broken. It would never heal properly, would hurt her for the rest of her life. Mama spent most of Hesia's childhood in her bed, staring at the ceiling. Occasionally, she would allow her children in there with her and kiss their heads. These were the best days, when the three of them were snuggled together warm and cozy as the wind howled outside but most of the time mama was too tired or in too much pain to snuggle or to tell a bedtime story or to cook so hesia learned early how to take care of her mama to bring her tea in the mornings to brush her hair when she consented to being touched or coax her to eat a piece of bread she knew what the other children said about her mother Hana Sapirov, the crazy one, the Meshugana, uh, never leaves the house, talks to people who aren't there. And she heard echoes of their own mother's pity in their voices. Poor Hesia, poor Labe, always so hungry, so dirty. Their pity was Hesia's constant companion, her closest friend. And she hated it. By 18, Hesia had earned a reputation for prickliness for rebuffing her neighbor's soft words and obvious desire to help. Hesia had been taking care of her mother since she was a child. She didn't need anything from anyone except Laib. Not their sympathy or their stares, and certainly not their charity. I'd rather they just hated us, she raged to Laib, whispering so Mama wouldn't hear. She didn't want to upset her mother, who had taken to calling for the husband she had buried 17 years before, who woke in the middle of the night screaming. 
I am sick of being treated like we're pathetic. We are not pathetic, Labe. She crossed her arms. Of course we're not, he said. Look at us. We've got food, a roof, clothes. We're just fine. True, the food was scarce, the roof needed patching, and the clothes had been mended so many times they were falling apart. And, true, their mother needed help neither of them could give. But Labe didn't believe in complaining. So, neither did Hesia. Because if she thought for one second about how unfair it all was, her father murdered, her mother crazy, her neighbors full of pity and disdain, well, she'd fall apart like Mama. So Hesia shoved those thoughts away and focused instead on the one thing that brought her joy, Eretz Yisrael. Like everyone else in her tiny town, Hesia had grown up praying towards Jerusalem. But for centuries, the Jerusalem of liturgy felt like an idea, a fantasy that one day things would be better, that God would remember his people suffering under foreign thrones and bring them home at last. And after millennia of exile, of living under the boots of foreign kings, something strange began to happen. Jerusalem began to emerge from the haze of myth, become real. After all, the city still existed, still rose, walled, and majestic above the Judean hills, its stones touched with gold. And so, as a small group of Jews began talking about going back, others began to listen. At first, Hesia had been skeptical of Labe's passions. You think the Sultan is any better than the Tsar? she asked. I think anyone would be better than the Tsar. But Labe didn't care really who was in charge. What mattered to him was breathing the air his ancestors had breathed, walking in their footsteps. You'll see, he told Hesia, the night he dragged her to one of his meetings. It's the only place for us, the only solution. Why have we been talking about Jerusalem for 2,000 years as though it's gone? It still exists. There are ships. We can even get there on foot. I am not walking to Eretz Israel, Hesia said, crossing her arms. But Leib was right. Why dream of a better life when you could build one? When it was right there waiting patiently for you to come and take it back? Soon, Hesia was a regular fixture at the Chovavei Tzion meetings, the Lovers of Zion, they called themselves, a romantic name for a romantic project, the resuscitation of a desolate homeland. She was often the only woman in the room, but her eyes glowed when they talked about returning to the land of their forefathers. They would till the soil, plant enough trees to cover the land in a canopy of leaves, bring their bread forth from the earth with the sweat of their brows. On the best nights, Someone would produce crumpled old issues of Eretz Yisrael's Hebrew language newspaper, Hatzvi. It didn't matter that the newspapers were old, reporting on events months or years in the past. They had actually come from Eretz Yisrael. The room would go hushed and respectful as they poured over each issue, puzzling out the modern Hebrew, learning words like journalist, editor, opinion. Hesia took to peppering her speech with stilted, formal Hebrew. It didn't matter that her conversation was stiff and ungrammatical, that the cadences were more biblical than modern. It was Hebrew, the language of Jewish warriors and kings. One night, towards the end of 1899, Yasela Grice called the meeting to order with more excitement than usual. I've just received word, he announced, that Yaakov Zvi is coming this spring. The room erupted in cheers and shouts and questions, but the name meant nothing to Hesia. You were too little to remember him, Leib told her. Yaakov Wolfovich. He's my age, maybe a year older or younger. His parents left right after his grandparents were killed in the pogrom. So he grew up in Eretz Israel. They changed their name to Zevi, you know... Zev means wolf in Hebrew. Yes, yes, she said impatiently, not even caring that Labe had the audacity to condescend about her Hebrew. She was too hypnotized by the prospect of a childhood spent in Eretz Israel. So he grew up there, this Yaakov, from the time he was a boy? He did. He had siblings born there. 
Can you imagine children born in Eretz Israel? Hesia shook her head. It was a fantastic image. She imagined sturdy little children, brown with sun, running around the hills of Jerusalem. But Leib's next sentence punctured the vision. Most of them died from malaria, but I think a sister survived. I think maybe he was sick as a child or starving. You'll see when you meet him, he's kind of small. Maybe stunted. Why on earth is he coming back here? She asked. If I had the chance to leave, I wouldn't look back. Leib laughed. <laughs> he's a good speaker. He travels around Europe to tell Jews about Eretz Israel. He's amazing. You'll see. He can convince the religious that Eretz Israel is their destiny. And then right after that, he can get the secular interested. He could even charm the ones who think they want to go to America. Convince them to go to Eretz Israel instead. Hesia couldn't wait to hear him speak. But when Yaakov Zevi finally showed up, it was not what she expected. Yaakov told them that Eretz Israel was beautiful. More beautiful than they could imagine, but treacherous. Harsh. You'll need to work harder than you've ever worked before. His gaze lingered on Hesia when he spoke, and she rolled her eyes. <laughs> As though a man could outwork a woman who cooked, cleaned, laundered, mended, chopped wood, kept the garden, haggled at the market, cared for her sick mother, and found the time to study Hebrew by candlelight. And there is sickness, he warned. It's taken entire communities before. It took three of my brothers and sisters. As though there was no sickness in Russia. As though she hadn't spent her life watching her mother wilt because of a sickness in her mind. And don't think, he warned, that just because you're in Eretz Yisrael, you'll be safe. There are bandits, tribesmen who make off with livestock, Ottoman officers who cause trouble now and again, but we have guns, he said proudly. Anyone who bothers us faces the consequences. We all participate. Everyone stands watch. Not just the men. Again, his eyes returned to Hesia. And again, she ignored him. No talk of bandits could frighten her. Did Yako forget who he was talking to? They were all survivors in that room. Every single one. Why was he trying to scare us off? She asked Leib later as they walked home. He talks as though we don't realize that building a home is hard work. I think he wants us to know the truth, Leib said. That it isn't for everyone. You know that some of the people who went to Eretz Yisrael ten years ago have already left? It was too hard for them. Hesia huffed. It can't be harder than here. Leib looked at her. You think you could defend yourself against bandits? Shoot a gun at another human being? If they were coming to hurt me, I wouldn't hesitate, she said and paused. Wouldn't you? If you had a gun that day, when they... Of course, he said shortly. I would have shot them ten times over. His voice was bitter. It hurt to listen to. What will we do with Mama? She asked, changing the subject. When we go to Eretz Israel. I don't know, Lape said. She's not strong enough for the boat. But we can't leave her here alone. The Sapirov siblings looked at each other. Neither one would say out loud that they were waiting for their mother to die so they could finally start to live. You were not kidding about this story being a downer. It's a hard story, I know. When did all of this happen? Hesia was born in 1880. A year later, the Tsar was assassinated, and of course, who got punished? The Jews. There were almost two years of pogroms after that. So that's when Hesia's father was killed? Yes. I won't tell you how they killed him. The mother survived. In her body, at least. They did things to her, the mob. More than one man. And Leib saw everything. God, that's so awful. How did the kids survive? I think Hesia they hid somewhere, but Leib was too big to hide. They may have thought it was funny to make him watch. There was unbelievable cruelty during those pogroms. That's so incredibly sick. 
This was the experience of being Jewish and powerless. All of our ancestors experienced this, in Europe and elsewhere. No wonder Hesia wanted a gun. There were weapons in Europe. Some guns, more sticks and clubs, even gardening tools. And there were Jewish self-defense groups, especially after the Kishinev pogrom in 1903. It's a false story that you hear that European Jews were completely defenseless. They weren't, not all of them. Many tried to fight back. I'm sure they were outnumbered. Of course. You have to understand. Sometimes thousands of people join the pogroms. High-class people, priests, policemen, and, of course, the ordinary hooligans who wanted an excuse to beat up the Jews. It was like uh, a storm. You can't fight a storm. It's so awful to think about. Yes, but their group, their movement, Chovevei Tzion, it gave them hope. I've never even heard of it. It was even before Herzl. You know Herzl? The man who started the political Zionist movement. Yeah, of course, but... Why does he get all the credit if there was a Zionist group before him? Shia cuts in before Amalia can answer. Why doesn't King David get all the credit? Or the Maccabees? Or Ezra Nehemia? Who? The whole bus is looking at Shia as he continues. It's in Bereshis, first book of the Torah. Lech lecha, me'artzecha, umi moladetecha, umi beisavicha, el ha'oretz asher areko. Hashem tells Avram, leave your birthplace, leave your father's house, and go to the land I'll show you. That's the land of Israel. Our relationship with the land starts 4,000 years ago. Doesn't sound so modern to me. Right, but I mean as a political concept. It wasn't political when Joshua led Bnei Israel to take the city of Yericho. It wasn't political when the kings of Israel and Judah fought with Assyria and Babylon to make sure their kingdoms would remain standing. It wasn't political when the Maccabees fought to restore their way of life from the Greeks? I get what you're saying, but none of those people were Zionists in the modern sense. I told you before, it depends what you mean by a Zionist. It's all a matter of definitions. Actually, I agree with him. It's a matter of definitions. But Emily, you're also right. All these other movements, Chovevei and Zion, Bilu, they were active before he came up with the concept of Zionism. But they came to Israel in small numbers. They weren't organized. Herzl created the movement, and all the other groups, eventually they became part of this larger movement. It united them. Religious people, secular people. It became like a, hmm, like an umbrella. What was that other movement? B? Bilu. Very passionate, very idealistic. Their love for Israel was, uh, it came from a place of religion. Whole families made the move to Israel, and many died from sickness, malaria, even hunger. And a lot of them got frustrated and left. But the ones who stayed, uh, they are the ones who really started to build the country. Like Hestia. When did they start coming? After the pogroms in 1881, it, there was a movement. It was called the First Aliyah. It was from 1881 to 1903. Mostly religious people with families. The Second Aliyah started in 1904, after Kishinev, but before the next wave of pogroms in 1905. How do you keep all of these pogroms straight? It's like a never-ending list. <laughs> it's true. You know, you look at immigrants, even to the United States, and you think, your life was so hard. They were poor. They struggled. They didn't have what to eat. But then you compare it to where they came from, and you start to understand a little bit why they left. So when did Hesia and Leib get here? In 1901 right at the end of the first Aliyah. So they were part of this religious group? Yes, they were from a 
religious home. Though Hesia did not remain religious, her daughter, my grandmother, she did not grow up in a religious house, and neither did my mother. And you? A bit traditional, because of my husband. But I think for Hesia, religion was something she left behind. Her religion became the land. So she was like a farm worker? Ah, oh, yes. They came to a settlement. It's a big city now. Almost hard to believe what it looked like then. But at the time, it produced oranges. They worked in the orange groves. That must have been pretty different from Russia. The work was very hard, especially when there were droughts. Did they bring their mom with them when they moved? It sounds like she was not well. No. Their mother died before they came. I think this is why they came when they did. They would have gone earlier if they could. And if she hadn't died, they would have stayed. They wouldn't have left her. That's so sad. Yes. I think there was maybe a, mm, a sense of relief when she died. It sounds like they never really had a childhood. No, never. I think coming here... It was the most free they'd ever been. How old was she, Hesia, when she came here? It was uh, 1901. She would have been 21. Younger than me. A baby. But only in age, not in experience. I have a feeling I know the answer to this, but did things get easier for her once she got here? No, they didn't. But she still managed to find some happiness, even through the challenges. Hesia was not ashamed to admit that the first sight of Jaffa made her cry. She hadn't cried in years. Prided herself, in fact, on not crying at all. But she was so relieved to finally be off that godforsaken boat that her eyes filled with tears. Finally, a night without nausea without the lurching of the sea. I know, Leib said, standing next to her, tears running down his face. I can't believe we're finally in Eretz Israel. I can't believe we're finally getting off this boat, she answered. Leib sniffed. You have no emotions at all, do you? He asked, only half teasing. Oh, I have plenty of emotions, she said, like joy and relief and a deep-seated hatred of the ocean. I never want to see another boat again in my life. Well, you won't have to, he said, slinging an arm across her shoulders. You're home. We're home, she corrected. <sighs> Finally home. Home turned out to be... hot. Hesia had heard about the heat in Eretz Yisrael, had dreamed of it even in the bitter cold of the Russian winter, but... It was difficult to sleep, let alone dream, in the airless room she shared with a young woman named Leah. Leah was a nice enough sort, but she was chatty, excitable, and at the end of a long day of work in the sun, Hesia craved silence. So, she took to wandering Petach Tikva at night, desperate for a breeze. She liked the heady scent of the citrus groves. It was bright out tonight. The sky freckled with hundreds of stars. She turned her face up, staring at the swirl of light. And collided instantly with something solid. Be careful, a man's voice speaking Hebrew. She had walked directly into him. You be careful, she retorted, to cover her embarrassment. Why are you just standing there like an idiot? This isn't a guard post. Why are you wandering around in the middle of the night, he snapped. Is walking around illegal now? She asked, crossing her arms. He squinted at her. I know you, he said slowly, switching to Yiddish. You're the angry one. Speak Hebrew, she said in Hebrew. You're in Eretz Israel. You don't remember me? He asked, still in Yiddish. She looked him up and down. A bold look. The kind that nice girls weren't supposed to give. But... Hesia wasn't a nice girl. She was tough, a chalutza, a pioneer. And pioneers had no time for the social niceties they had left behind in Russia. 
He had gray eyes, starting to crinkle at the corners, though he couldn't be over 30. A reddish beard. They were almost exactly the same height. His face was familiar, but she couldn't place it. Should I remember you? she asked. You certainly glared at me enough when I came to tell you about Eretz Israel. A memory surfaced. Yaakov, the man who came to talk about life in Eretz Israel, the one who had stared at her and implied she wasn't tough enough to make it as a pioneer. I see my speech worked, he said, grinning. Here you are. Oh, the speech where you tried your best to scare us off, she asked. I told you the truth, he countered. My parents walked into a fantasy. I want everyone who comes here to be better prepared. She sniffed. It was annoyingly solid logic. Why are you here anyway? She asked. Aren't you supposed to be spreading the word about life in Eretz Israel? Sure, he said. But I miss it when I'm not here. Let's call this a vacation, he smiled. I'm Yaakov, by the way. She refused to acknowledge that she already knew his name. And I'm finishing my walk now. Good night. She marched away, his voice trailing after her. Good night to you too, Hesya Sapirov. Let me guess. They get married. Within three months. So that's your great-grandfather. Yes. I don't even have a picture of him, but from what I hear, he was so oh, very special. It sounds like things were looking up for Hesia. Not for long, I'm sorry to say. Her husband and her brother died within six months of each other in 1905. Lab from malaria, Yaakov in a pogrom. As you know, he went back and forth between Russia and Palestine. He was in Russia, or what is now Ukraine, during the pogroms of 1905. Well, I hate that. Did she ever get married again? No, never. But she had a daughter with Yaakov. My grandmother, Rina. They were very close, Hesya and Rina. And together they conducted an experiment. An experiment? In 1918, right before the end of World War I. When Rena was 14, they left the settlement and moved to a kibbutz. An experiment, not always a successful one. Hesia had wanted to leave Petach Tikva the moment her brother died. Leib and Yaakov haunted the citrus groves, and she refused to turn into her mother, talking to people who were no longer there. But Rena had been so young. And in the days of those first few months, Hesia allowed herself to be convinced to stay. Soon, she gave in to inertia. Why uproot her daughter from her home? They might have stayed in Petah Tikva forever had Rena not been the one to broach the subject. Ima, she said one night as they walked arm in arm through the groves. This had been their evening tradition since Rena was old enough to totter unsteadily, holding her mother's hand. These walks were Hesia's uninterrupted time with her girl. They talked about everything. Community gossip, Rena's hopes and dreams, current events, and tonight, something surprising. Ima, I have a question, Rena said, and I'm excited to hear that question. It's kind of crazy, Rena warned, those tend to be the most interesting questions, Hesia said. Come on, out with it. What if... What if we left Petar Tikva? Rina said in a rush. Hesia had never belittled her daughter, listened to all of her ideas calmly as though each were deserving of consideration. But tonight, her shock got the better of her. Left? As in went somewhere else? Exactly. Where would we go? Rena shrugged. Anywhere. Anywhere? Like Paris or America? Rena laughed. <laughs> of course not, Ima. I meant Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, the north near the Kinneret. Just somewhere that isn't here. Why? Hesia asked. This is our home. Rena fidgeted. 
Rina? Why would we leave here? Hesia repeated, suspicious. Images from a nightmare flashed through her mind. Was someone hurting her daughter? I'll kill them, Hesia vowed. But Rina interrupted this train of thought. I'm tired of everyone feeling bad for me, she responded. Oh, we knew your father. Oh, he was such a good man. Oh, you poor little thing. I just want to be normal. She looked at her mother, whose face had gone blank. Ima, are you upset with me? But Hesia was no longer in the grove with her daughter. She was back in Russia, ten million years ago, stick thin and grubby, ranting to her brother about this very same thing. I'm sick of being treated like we're pathetic. Oh, the poor little orphans and their crazy mother touched in the head after the pogrom. We're not pathetic, Leib. We're not. Essia had sworn to herself that Rina would have a different life, a better one. And here she was breaking that promise without even knowing it, making her daughter into an object of pity simply by staying here. Ima, please, I- I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. Rina sounded close to tears. Hesia pulled her close, kissed her head. You didn't upset me, she said. I know what it is to feel the way you do. Hesia had never told her daughter about her own childhood, had answered all of Rina's questions with, I'll tell you when you're older, and you'll know when the time is right. The time was right. So, two things happened that evening. The first was that Rina Zevi learned about her mother's past. Hesia answered every question, even the ones that made her suck in her breath with sadness and pain and rage. And Rina, to her credit, listened stoically, did not cry. The second outcome of that evening was that Hesia made her daughter a promise. We're going to start over, just you and me. And now, here they were a year later. Hesia stared at the simple whitewashed building as Rachel, who was helping them settle into the kibbutz, explained again that Rina was to live in the youth quarters. I don't understand why my daughter can't sleep with me in my quarters, Hesia said, crossing her arms. We told you already, property is shared, everything is communal. You agreed to this, Rachel said, sounding annoyed. I didn't realize children were considered property, Hesia snapped. Rina spoke up before her mother could respond. I think it could be fun living in the youth quarters, Ima. Hesia regarded her daughter. She was already taller than her mother. Had her father's serious gray eyes. She was Hesia's whole heart. Everything she cherished in one gawky, long-limbed package. But how could she tell her daughter, I never want to let you out of my sight? You couldn't do that to a child. Not one this lively and independent. And Rina was barely a child anyway. Hesia had certainly never treated her like one. What did she know about how to be a mother? She knew only what she shouldn't do. Don't neglect your children. Don't talk to ghosts in front of them. Don't tell them you wish you had died in a pogrom along with their father. So, from the moment her daughter was born, Hesia treated her like an adult. By 14, Rina could milk a cow build crude lodgings, plant and pick endless rows of fruits and vegetables, start a fire, brew very strong coffee, speak and read and write in perfect Hebrew, in addition to a smattering of Turkish, Arabic, English, and French. But not Yiddish. Never Yiddish. It was the language of exile, of pogroms, things she vowed her daughter would never know. It was dangerous to love a child this much. A luxury to surrender to such deep emotion, but Hesia couldn't help it. And now, Rina was looking at her with wide eyes that said, Ima, don't make a scene. Let me sleep in the youth quarters. Let me go to the regional school many kilometers from here. Let me be like everyone else. And Hesia had no choice. As she stood there, looking between Rachel, Rina, and the simple whitewashed building where her daughter would live with seven other boys and girls, She felt something unfamiliar, unwelcome, distance. For the first time since Rena was born, she felt a gulf open between them. Somehow she was on one side and Rena on the other. But Hesia would sooner cut off her own arm 
than show her daughter how much it hurt to let her go. So when her daughter told Rachel how excited she was to meet her new bunkmates, Hesia said nothing. Rina was too tactful, too mindful of her mother's feelings, to add, I've always wanted sisters and brothers, but the unspoken words stabbed at Hesia's heart. That had been the plan, to have a little troop of children, with their mother's curly hair and their father's wicked sense of humor, tiny pioneers, their feet planted firmly in the soil of Eretz Israel, Hebrew the language on their tongues, the sky and soil their only religion. But of course, Russia had taken that from her too. Her mother, her father, her husband, and now her children. Her daughter's siblings. How could this place that she had left behind still manage to snatch away her future? But these were pointless thoughts. Inefficient. Unproductive. And if there was one thing that wasn't welcome in Eretz Israel, it was wasting time on the past. There was too much to do here in the present. So, she looked at Rina's hopeful eyes, took in her cautious smile, as though she was afraid to hurt her mother with excitement. She let her daughter go without her into the youth quarters to greet the strangers who would replace her phantom brothers and sisters, and turned away, her heart cracking in half. Hold on. Hesia had to give up her kid to live on the kibbutz? Not exactly. She still saw Rina every day. But in the early kibbutzim, everything was shared, including taking care of children. Everything was shared. Like, everything, everything. Like, all your stuff? Exactly. Clothes, money, everything was pooled. Is that how you grew up too? Like, nothing of your own? No, no. My parents were both raised like this. But when it came time for them to raise children, they didn't want it for us. We lived in a much more, mm, moderate way. Which one of your parents is related to Hesia? My mother. My mother is Rena's daughter. Hesia's granddaughter. Got it. So your mom also grew up on a kibbutz, sharing everything and living in children's quarters. Yes, but this experiment, sharing everything, it didn't last so long. Maybe 50 years. It turned out people like having their own things and raising their own children. The children's houses. It was a good idea in theory. It was a way to free women from women's work. A way to make sure that a mother could be equal to a father. That's definitely interesting. It makes sense to me. <laughs> I have three children. Believe me, I've wanted the help of an entire kibbutz when they were growing up. But, of course, the thought of only seeing them four hours a day. The thought that our family life would really be community life. I would have hated this. I would have missed so much. Did the kids like it at least? I feel like it could be really fun, like sleepaway camp all the time. I'm sure many kids liked it, but I'm sure also that it was not right for many of them. There were cases of abuse. Like between kids? Kids abusing each other? This too, but also, you know, humans are humans everywhere, and even though the kibbutz was supposed to be an ideal, a uh, safe place, it only takes one person to ruin everything. You're saying adults abuse the kids. I don't think it happened often, but it did happen. Even a utopia isn't really a utopia. <sighs> that kind of feels like the theme of today. She nods toward Elune. I feel like that's a big part of your story, Elaine. Thinking that this would be a perfect place and being surprised when it wasn't. Elune nods, but says nothing. Isn't this the story for all idealists? Nachi, for example, came here for ideals. Nachi nods. Yeah, but I got lucky. The Kaur is pretty close to my ideal. <laughs> Though that might be because I've never had to share my personal property with anyone. It does sound nice in a weird way. Though I don't think I'd be down to share all my stuff. I'm very attached to my phone. What about eating all your meals in the communal dining hall? That I think I'd like, actually. 
I'm an extrovert, in case you hadn't noticed. (laughs) I am not. So for me, this sounds horrible. Yeah, I hear that. But I think this communal lifestyle, this hmm, idealism, it was the right thing for so many people. They were so idealistic, so ready to sacrifice for the sake of something bigger. It sounds like all the early immigrants were like that, not just the kibbutz people. Yes, you're right. To come here, it was very, very hard. There was so much against them, so much difficulty. Makes those of us who came here in the 90s look bad. It was so easy for us. Yeah, I came here on a plane to a fully developed country. Oh, I don't know. I heard that the water doesn't heat up as fast as you might like it. (laughs) She smiles at Emily, clearly referencing the very loud conversation she'd been having when the Sherwood's tire blew out. Emily rolls her eyes. I'm never going to live that down, am I? I'm only teasing, but you're right. We all have it easy compared to them. I think about this a lot. Emily twists in her seat to find the woman who has just spoken. She's sitting in the very front of the shared taxi, right behind Roe. There's a colorful scarf covering most of her dark hair, and she's smiling widely at Emily. Hello, I am Ortal. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Amalia. I just wanted to agree with everyone. I came here from Paris when I was 18, eight years ago, and every time I had a difficulty, I would think about people who died to come here, or who came here on a boat, or who got malaria, or who built cities for us. They gave us everything, the whole future. Yes, exactly. They were all so, so willing to sacrifice. They didn't think, what is comfortable for me? They thought, what would be good for the Jewish people, for the next generation? Yes, not that they always did a good job. Building a country is difficult. They made mistakes, they experimented, like with the children's quarters or with sharing everything. Of course, but it's natural to make mistakes. It's like Alain said, he came to a country that was still being built. It wasn't ready for him yet. Even the people who came here in the 50s, the 60s, it was still a work in progress. I think it still is. Yes, but not in the same way. The, um, kibbutzes, are they still around? Kibbutzim, yes, but different. Now they are mostly capitalist. They sell things. Like crops? Some of them do things that are related to agriculture, showing other countries how our irrigation systems work, or... I don't know. I don't know anything about agriculture. But many of them produce things to export. There is one that exports eyeglasses. That's so random. Everybody has to find a way to make money. Is that why you moved away from the kibbutz? For money? Not exactly. I wanted to be in a city for my job. And my husband thought that kibbutzim were very snobby. He didn't want this kind of life. Snobby? They sound really down to earth, really welcoming. I told you, utopia is not really utopia. They also had problems. Even now, the original kibbutzim are considered, um, what's the word? Elitist? A lot of the top people in the army, in politics, they came from the kibbutz system. And of course, the original kibbutzim were very mm, Ashkenazi and very secular. They had a very specific vision of who they wanted. For example, if Elaine's family had tried to join a kibbutz in the 50s or 60s, I don't think they would have been accepted, though probably they also would not have been interested because they were religious. She looks over at Elun, who nods. They didn't accept Moroccans? Is that what you mean? There were a lot of people they did not accept. They had a very specific vision, I told you. Are they still like that? I don't think so, but I don't know for sure. Maybe there are some that are still difficult. I was really into this whole kibbutz thing until this. This is why we can't have nice things. (laughs) Humans are humans. We're capable of wonderful things and terrible things, sometimes at the same time. So was Hestia like, 
I, I don't know how to ask this nicely. Racist? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. She died in 1950, and she lived her whole life among people who had come here from Europe. I don't think she had much contact with Miss Rahim. Oh, man. I know rationally that she's not alive anymore because you said she was born in 1880, but I'm still sad to hear about her dying. I kind of feel like I know her. She was a strong person, a strong personality. So... This is the story of my family. The story of how we got here. Do you know anything about what happened to Hesia after independence, 1948? I know from my grandmother and my mother that she was... Uh, this was her dream. Normally, she did not cry. But she cried when they declared independence. And she never talked about her husband or her brother. But she did that day. She was very sad they could not be there to see it. Where was she when they declared independence? I don't know. Hmm. Maybe in the kibbutz. But maybe they were already evacuated then. You know that as soon as they declared independence, the Arab nations attacked. Yeah, I know. Some people stayed to fight, but she was already old. Sixty-eight. So she and my grandmother and my mother were evacuated together from their kibbutz. My grandfather stayed and fought against the Syrians. The Syrians? Yes, they were one of the armies that attacked. Their kibbutz was in the north, close to the Syrian border. The Syrians tried to destroy it. Did they? Destroy it, I mean. No, no, no. no. They were defeated by our army. And in fact, when Hesia and Rina and my mother came back to the kibbutz, there was a Syrian tank sitting there, like a symbol of victory. And it's still there, even today. That's wild. That's Israel for you. History everywhere. That's why I love it so much here. The whole story of our people is here. You see it. You feel it. You can even touch it. This is true. For good and for bad. Emily, have you been to the north of Israel? No, not yet. You should go there. It's beautiful. Very green. Mountains, hills, rivers, basalt. Beautiful. But also, you can see the scars on the landscape. The places where there were wars. Places where there are still... landmines. Landmines? There are signs. As long as you can read, you won't step on one. <laughs> I'm interested and not interested, you know what I mean? But this is recent history. I love the ancient history. The ruins, the coins buried in the earth, the artifacts. Proof that we were here even a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, four thousand years ago. It's like he was saying... She nods to Nahi. It's everywhere. The footsteps of our ancestors. You know, in my regular life, I don't think about this at all. I think about it all the time. I'm still amazed every day. I think we Sabras, Israelis were born here. Take it for granted. This is not how I think about Israel. It's not a, a myth, a story in a history book. It's cities and traffic and grocery stores and therapy appointments and everyday life. And history, all of it together in one place. You have a really romanticized perspective. It is the way I was raised on these stories. And so I came to live here and these stories are all around me and I see them everywhere. You remind me a little of Elaine. Or maybe even of Hesia. Or Tall Smiles. Who knows? I am half Moroccan, half Tunisian. Maybe Alain and I are related. That would be wild. It's not likely. There are a lot of us here, in Israel, and also in France. But we come from the same culture, me and Alain. We feel our Judaism here. She touches her heart. Elun nods in agreement. I think this is true of us, maybe more than other communities. Oh, I don't know. I feel the same way. Maybe it's true of people who came here later in life. By choice. Yes, it is hard to survive here otherwise, unless you have the... the passion. Yes, exactly. This is what kept Hesia here. 
After all, even if it would have been easier to leave. Emily turns to Ortal. It sounds like you've definitely got passion. Yes, very much. It is how I grew up, on all the stories of Israel. But in my family, it was my grandmother Giselle who was the storyteller, not my mother. Thank you for listening to Episode 7 of Homeland. Ten stories, one Israel. Homeland is a production of Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. Check out jewishunpacked.com for everything Unpacked related and subscribe to our other podcasts. Follow Unpacked at all the social media places like TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Just look for at Jewish Unpacked and write to us at podcasts at jewishunpacked.com. This episode was written by Adi Elbaz and produced by Rifki Stern. Our team for this episode includes Adi Elbaz as Emily, Sherry Wishard as Amalia, Nati Rabinowitz as Shaya, Eric Ransom as Nachi, and Joanne Lichtenstein as Ortal. Audio Magic was produced by Rob Perra. I'm your narrator, Ellie Schiff. Special thanks to Hod Zaguri Wittenberg and Shaked Karabelnikov. This show was made possible by support from the Coombe Family Foundation, the Crane Mailing Foundation, the Adam and Gila Milstein Family Foundation, and the Skolnick Family Charitable Trust. Stay tuned for Episode 8, which tells Ortal's story about growing up as a Tunisian in France, but longing for Israel. <laughs>